Excelsior, true believers. Stan Lee is the biggest name in the history of comic books. He created or co-created characters that are world known. Iron Man, the X-Men, the Incredible Hulk, and Spider-Man are just a few. But what most fans don't know is that his very first superhero creation is almost completely forgotten in the Marvel Universe. In 1939, 16-year-old Stanley Martin Lieber graduated high school and was looking for a job. His father, a dress cutter, couldn't find steady work in the garment industry due to the Depression. To help his family, Stan had taken on odd jobs since he was a young child. After graduation, Stanley went through a number of dead-end jobs. It was Stan's Uncle Robbie that suggested they go see if there was an opening at the place he worked at, a place called Timely Comics. Timely Comics was owned by a distant cousin by marriage, Martin Goodman. Most of the employees there were somehow related to Goodman, with the exception of editor Joe Simon and art director Jack Kirby. Uncle Robbie, with Stanley in tow behind him, walked up to Joe Simon and said, Martin wants you to keep him busy. No one remembers for sure if anyone had talked to Martin on Stanley's behalf. It didn't matter to Joe Simon. Stanley's appearance couldn't have come at a better time. The Timely staff was extremely talented, but small. They struggled to keep up with the workload. Timely Comics was started by Martin Goodman. Goodman was a small, pulp magazine publisher who decided to jump in the comic book field when the numbers for action comics starring Superman were becoming known. Goodman went to an independent packager of comics called Funnies, Inc. He purchased enough material to put together a comic book he simply titled Marvel Comics. The book would feature the exploits of not one, but two superheroes, the Human Torch and the Submariner. Goodman printed 80,000 copies with an October 1939 date on it. It sold out. He printed the book a second time with a November cover date on it. This time he printed 800,000 copies, and guess what? They too sold out. That clinched it for Goodman. Comic books was the field to be in. He went back to Funny Zinc, but instead of buying more art and stories, he went after their staff. Goodman felt for him to be successful, he had to cut out the middleman. It would be far more efficient to hire his own staff than to use an outside art studio. First, he hired away editor Joe Simon. He brought with him Carl Burgos, who had created the Human Torch, and Bill Everett, who had created the Submariner. Simon also hired his friend Jack Kirby. Simon and Kirby had first met at Fox Publications working on the Blue Beetle. At Funny Inc., they had teamed up on a science fiction-based superhero named Blue Bolt. From the start, the timely offices were jumping. The small staff needed help to keep up, even if it did come from a 16 and a half year old kid. Stanley was hired for the hefty sum of $8 a week. After a week on the job, Stan declared, I know everything, and then demanded a promotion. Simon obliged the youngster by giving him more responsibilities. However, he still only paid him $8 a week. The kid learned how to clean up artwork and ink over pencil lines. He did lettering for the word balloons. Stan learned all the inner workings of how to make a comic book. He was still fetching sandwiches and coffee, but editor Joe Simon was giving him a chance to prove himself. Stan had the soft ambition to be a novelist. At this time, the young man had his entire life in front of him, and he didn't picture himself staying in comics very long. He had placed three times in the New York Herald's essay writing contest for teens. It was a feat no one else had ever done. He was imagining future literary success, but not in comics. His first opportunity to write came up in Captain America issue number three. The issue was running two pages short. Joe Simon told Stan to go home and write a text-only story to fill out the issue. They didn't have time to draw and ink a graphic story and get it to the printer on time. Stan went home and came back with a 28-paragraph Captain America and Bucky story. Captain America Foils the Traitor's Revenge was written in the type of prose that was prevalent in low-rent pulp magazines of the day. But the story proved two things. 
One, Stan could write a narrative story, and two, Stan could meet a deadline. Afraid of using his real name, Stanley uses a pen name. The name Stan Lee appears in comic books for the very first time. Stan's first graphic story would appear two issues later in Captain America issue number five. Stanley Martin Lieber had found his calling, but he did not know it yet. A superhero anthology title called Mystic Comics went back into publication after a seven-month hiatus. Joe Simon assigned Stan to work on the title. The book had featured such heroes as the original Black Widow, the Blazing Skull, and the Black Marvel. However, none of these characters had caught on. Stan was given the opportunity to create his own superhero. The sixth issue would feature the very first creation by the then 17-year-old writer, the Destroyer. Like Captain America, the Destroyer predates America's entry into World War II. While reporting on the war in Europe, American journalist Kevin Keen Marlowe is captured by the Nazis. They accuse him of spying. They throw him in a concentration camp where he meets German scientist Eric Schmidt. He too is a prisoner in the camp. The Nazis know that he was working on a top secret super soldier serum and they want it. They beat Schmidt horribly. He lies near death in a cell that he shares with Marlowe. He tells Marlowe that he has hidden the last of the serum in their jail cell. Marlowe finds it, drinks it. But before they can escape, Schmidt passes away. Marlowe breaks out of the concentration camp, but he stays in Germany. He dons a striped costume and fights the Nazis from behind enemy lines as the Destroyer. Over the next couple of years, the Destroyer's adventures would spread out across Timely's titles. He would even be welcomed into Timely's superhero team, the All Winners Squad. Stan was learning how to write and edit, and he was learning from the best. Joe Simon and Jack Kirby were considered by many to be the best storytellers in the business. A number of publishers had tried to steal them away from Timely, but to no avail. Two big reasons would change this and create a huge opportunity for their young protege. First, there was a major riff at the Timely offices. Simon and Kirby had a profit-sharing agreement with Martin Goodman over Captain America. They believed that Goodman was cheating them. Second, after Pearl Harbor, they both expected to be drafted. The two men wanted to provide for their families. The pay of an enlisted man could not compensate for the loss of their timely salaries. They worked out a deal with DC Comics to produce material that could be published while they were serving in the military. They rented a nearby hotel room and set up a makeshift art studio. At lunchtime and in the evenings, Simon and Kirby would leave Timely to work on DC stories. Stan realized something was up and asked if he could help out. Kirby told Simon, don't trust Stan. They took Stan along anyway. Shortly after Stan began helping them, word of their DC work made it back to Goodman. Simon and Kirby were promptly fired. Simon blamed DC staffers for ratting them out. However, Kirby blamed Stan. Goodman temporarily gave the 18-year-old Simon's editorial job. He told Stan that he would be replaced as soon as he could find someone. Goodman would be forced to find someone a year later. In 1942, Stan Lee was called up for military service. Captain America, the Human Torch, and the Submariner would have to continue on without him. Vincent Fago was hired to be editor during Stan's absence. Stan returned in 1945, but he didn't return to the same comic book industry he had left. Captain America had survived, but most of Timely's superheroes, like his destroyer, had fallen into a void. Westerns, horror, and crime had taken over the industry. He convinced Goodman to try publishing a superheroine called the Blonde Phantom. But the masked mystery woman failed to turn the tide. Interest in superheroes continued to wane. The once popular Marvel mystery comics limped on until 1949. Captain America only continued on until 1950. The changes in Stan's life were not limited to his professional career. His days of being a bachelor were over when he met Joan. They were married in 1947. Shortly after their marriage, Stan's mother passed away. Stan's 15-year-old kid brother Larry moved in with the newlyweds. Like Uncle Robbie before, Stan took Larry to work at the Timely offices. 
Larry Lieber grew up in the comic book world, and he went on to become a respected writer, artist, and editor in his own right. It was during this time when Martin Goodman began taking action to make his comic book line more competitive on the comic racks. He rebranded Timely into Atlas. The new Atlas line dedicated itself to cashing in on hot publishing trends. EC Comics had sent off a new wave of horror, science fiction, and war titles. They leaped to the forefront of the comic book industry. The Atlas plan was to copy them. Many comic book fans lament the Atlas years. The general feeling is that this time period was a waste of Stan Lee's talent. In reality, this was a very important time for Stan to develop as a writer. These non-superhero genres turned out to be a great storytelling proving ground. Stan perfected the art of setting up jokes and punchlines for humor books like Millie the Model. The Atlas Westerns taught him how to write for stoic heroes with a code. His war stories focused on emotion, camaraderie, and dramatic battlefield action. Complicated relationships and stories from the heart filled the romance titles, and the science fiction and horror titles required weird science, suspense, and twisted endings. Stan had to learn and master all the elements that took the telltale in these diverse genres. Staffers at Atlas said that Stan was the hardest working man in comics, and he would sit behind his typewriter all day, cranking out story after story. It was during this time period when Stan Lee became the master storyteller. When Atlas rebranded itself into Marvel Comics Group, Stan applied everything he'd learned into the new line. There was the comic book world before the first issue of Fantastic Four, and then there was the comic book world after. Stan Lee had learned how to build up drama, explosive action, and use complicated plot structures. His characters were complex, and so were their relationships with each other. The new Marvel comics made those of industry leader DC look old and stiff. In 1967, at the tail end of Batmania, Marvel sold almost as many comic books as DC. The difference being, Marvel had eight monthly titles, DC had over 40. Marvel expanded and grew, growing into the leader of the industry. It would take a quarter century before DC could catch up. Martin Goodman retired in 1972, and Stan was named publisher. In recent years, Stan Lee has become an icon of American pop culture. His name has almost become synonymous with the term superhero. Many of the characters he created or co-created have become household names, with the exception of one, his very first superhero, The Destroyer. In the 1970s, writer-editor Roy Thomas revived The Destroyer in the pages of The Invaders. Given a new alter ego, the character evolved into a new superhero, the Union Jack. In 2009, the original Destroyer was revived in a five-part miniseries. This relaunch was written by Robert Kirkman, who is probably better known for The Walking Dead. This story picks up in the modern era with a 90-year-old Destroyer trying to settle old scores and live out his final days.
I don't get it. I just don't get it. How can they sell so many of these? They're crap. I know. I mean, look at them. The stories are weird. The art is bad. The costume's all wrong. Why are kids buying them? Don't worry about it, Morty. In five years, no one will even remember (laughs) Spider-Man. If you think Spider-Man is bad, have you seen the Incredible Hulk? Ugh, don't get me started. Hulk smash! Hulk smash! Hulk smash? Brilliant dialogue, Stan. I just don't get it.